are here. Sorry about the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, I did want to take a time and welcome you all to our uh, MCR monthly webinar. This is a free uh, webinar that we offer for our partners in the Mid-Continental Region, which is a region that consists of six states, of uh, Colorado, uh, Kansas, Missouri, Wyoming, and uh, Nebraska. Uh, we have been, uh, we, we, we are very fortunate to work for the National Institutes of Health and the National Library of Medicine, specifically providing trainings for librarians and health educators in the areas of community assessment, community outreach, and other projects overall. Uh, today's session is worth 1.0 continuing education hours for CHESS and MCHESS certified individuals. And at the exit of the webinar, you should be prompted with a pop-up that will be able to, you will be able to fill out a form to receive your continuing education credit. Uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, forward that. You all have come into this room muted, so if you have any questions, please use the chat box on the bottom of the WebEx uh, screen to find what you need to do. And we will definitely work with you to help you uh, answer those questions and uh, work with you as we go forward. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today Dr. Vincent uh, uh, Francisco. Uh, he is, uh, an, is the director of the Community Toolbox. I will pull up his bio here and read it for you all so that you are familiar about him. And then we'll turn it over to him. So Dr. Vincent Francisco is the Kansas Health Foundation Professor of Community Leadership in the KU Department of Applied Behavioral Science and Director of the Center for Community Health and Development, a World Health Organization Collaboration Center at the University of Kansas. In his work, he uses behavioral science methods to help understand and improve conditions that affect population health and health equity. He publishes widely in the areas of health promotion and health equity, uh, health promotion, capacity building, and community-based research intervention. Dr. Francisco is co-developer of the Community Toolbox, a widely used internet-based resource for promoting community health and development. Uh, I, that was where I will end it so we can get into this today. So I will turn it over to Dr. Francisco. Thank you so much for that introduction, David. And uh, hopefully my audio is adequate for folks. Um, if not, please let me know, and um, I'll try to make some adjustments. The Community Toolbox has been um, a project that I've been involved with right from the very beginning. Um, sometimes I say um, it was at least partly my fault that we created this thing in the first place. It is huge. It is not your average website. This is um, a, a very serious community health promotion intervention that we started developing around 1993. Um, more formally, we received our first grant to develop content for the Community Toolbox um, in 1994. And, um, but in 1993, I saw an opportunity to take our tools that we were developing. We were developing um, really workshop materials and training materials uh, that would help people um, build their capacity to engage their community in a wide variety of different ways. We started developing advocacy tools. We were developing um, small pamphlets that would be how to write letters to your editor to try to do um, kind of advocacy, um, print advocacy like that, as well as advocacy skill training that's much more advanced on how to engage your legislators or how to engage um, um, people that are in decision-making positions and, and a wide variety of other tools. And so I'm gonna show you a few of those tools today. Um, what I'd like to do is to um, just sort of spend a, a minute or two on this page, which is the main landing page for the community toolbox. There have been other toolboxes out there. Um, they come and go. Um, we've stayed around for 26 years now, and, um, and we anticipate being around for, for quite a bit longer. Um, the promotional material says there's about 6,000 pages of how-to materials. That has not th that number has stayed the same for about eight or 10 years now. And that was the last time that I tried counting the pages. It's probably closer to 10,000 printed pages at this point in time. And, and so we don't encourage people to print it off, but we have organized the tools in a way that would allow people a little bit easier access into the tools. And um, 
the general navigation for the whole site across the top um, is a, a series of five buttons that um, any one of which has additional pull downs. It's, it's context, it's all context sensitive mouse overs. Um, fortunately, we built this in HTML5. We pay very close attention to, um, to making sure that this is accessible to other audiences. People that have, um, that use other languages, um, including folks that are, um, that have, that have visual impairments so that their web browsers and screen readers can um, access these tools. Um, we take that very seriously. When, when we find that there's a problem, we do our best to fix it and work with people to try to make sure that that fixing is getting done. Um, like I said, there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 pages of how-to materials. David, if you would uh, mouse over the learn a skill button uh, mm -hmm. and then click on the table of contents, please. So here's our table of contents. And we made a promise that the development team that's been part of this literally from the beginning, we made a promise to each other that this would not become the encyclopedia of community building. And what we ended up making was the encyclopedia of community building. And it's kind of a, a half running joke among us, but it's, it's both a gift and a major curse. There is so much content that it's really hard sometimes for people to get access to the content. We think it makes sense, but that's mostly because we're the developers. It makes sense to us. Does it make sense in other languages? Does it make sense in other cultures? Does it make sense in other communities that use the same language, um, like within the United States? Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it does not. On the right-hand side of the table of contents, we have these related toolkits, which um, any one of those is, is just sort of a, a summary of a, of a collection of tools, um, borrowing on that metaphor of community toolbox, we've got toolkits. We've also got best processes. We'll take a look at those in a minute. Um, David, could you click on chapter three under community assessment? Thank you. And so you'll see that within a chapter, we've got a, a, a variety of sections. This is one of our largest chapters. It has sections that guide people through the process of assessing community needs, community concerns, as well as assets in the community. And so um, the first section within a chapter usually is an overview section. It says, hey, what's here? And how, you know, how is this whole thing organized? And then um, within that, thank you for clicking on, on section one. Um, within that, you'll see that there's a main section, and then there's a tab for a checklist, a tab for examples, and then a tab for a PowerPoint. And these are, um, these are to, to the best of our um, ability, available within every section that we have. Um, these PowerPoints are actually the PowerPoints that my team uses. Um, I use them in class, I, my team uses them for workshops, and we just put them online and we make them available. You can download them, you can edit them, you can, you know, use them yourselves. Um, these, these are freely available to the, to the world. Um, the entire table of contents is available in English, it's in Spanish, it's about 60% available in Arabic, and a little bit more than half in Farsi at this point as well. And um, we're working diligently with partners overseas and domestically to try to um, improve um, the quality of the translations. Um, as some of you may know, um, translating is not an easy process. Um, you can't just take the text and put it into a machine translator to have it coming out making sense. Um, we don't do that at all, in fact. We work with partners worldwide um, to actually transliterate. So we reinvent the content um, because many times in another language, the concept doesn't even make sense. So you won't even see, um, well, in Spanish, it's sort of the title of the community toolbox is sort of um, community toolbox um, transliterated. But in Arabic, it's different. And in, and in Farsi, it's a bit different than that. And, um, and, and so the concepts don't quite make the same, same sort of sense. 
Um, you'll see that the navigation is, uh, we try to maintain um, some navigation throughout. Once you've gotten into one section and you kind of are able to see what's going on in that section, you can navigate or scroll down the left-hand side to see any other section within that chapter. Across the top of um, that section, you'll see all of the chapters lined up as well as a, a link back to the table of contents. So you can um, scroll back there and, and see what's going on. Um, within the world of community health promotion, the table of contents is organized in a way that really kind of makes a lot of, um, or it, it, it uh, fits with a lot of different um, um, sort of models and frameworks within the world of um, community health promotion. So hopefully um, worldwide, people are getting some very similar sort of training because um, the Europe system and the United States system is, is very similar. And uh, most countries, um, that's a lot of where their public health infrastructure gets their training, either from universities in, in Europe or in the United States, um, to the extent that they get training. Um, and, and then many other countries are building up their own training platforms now. I've got to say that the, the community toolbox is actually probably the wide, wide the most widely used um, training resource in the world. Um, it's, it's usage rate is so high that we've been told here at the University of Kansas by people in the administration and in our IT that the community toolbox generates more web traffic than all of the other websites at the University of Kansas combined, including the library, including the main, the main community, um, the main um, KU um, website itself and everything else, which is really significant because KU is a global um, university. We've got, we've got sites in a lot of different countries, actually, and partnerships with quite a few more. Um, let's see, if we would go back out to the table of contents, David, if you would. And if you would just scroll down just a little bit, so you can see that it goes from assessment to communication tools to developing a strategic plan, to developing leadership and analyzing community problems. Um, shortly after that um, is developing community interventions um, and then building cultural competence. Um, so a lot of the science, and if we could just stay there for a minute, David. Um, thank you, sir. Um, the, the cultural competence and the spirituality in community building are some of our newest tools and we're, um, we're actually always, almost always in the process of revising these tools. We partnered with, um, um, let's see, what do they call themselves? The Compassionate Communities um, Group um, that um, is, is actually got a very strong international audience um, to develop the spirituality and community building sections. So we're really quite proud of those. We've, we've operationalized behaviorally um, a lot of different activities that comprise spirituality, such as forgiveness, compassion, um, justice. We've, we've taken those and we've put them into operational format and um, have training materials associated with them. And then we also have materials to help people understand, um, you know, issues, very complicated issues, of course, related to racial justice, inclusion. And we try to do this from, um, from a worldwide perspective but also from a local perspective. And so um, here in the United States, we actually created, and, and I'll show you this um, in just a few minutes, uh, a mashup page, we call them mashups, that um, are really tailored towards specific issues or outcomes. So because of the last couple of months and the final, um, you know, sort of people are finally starting to pay attention in a new way to issues related to um, um, justice and inclusion and um, anti-blackness, anti-black racism, and the really deep insidious um, web in our culture that, 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 is, that, is, um, that, is, that makes up all of those issues. Um, we've got a toolkit, we've got a mashup there that allows us to um, sort of get access to, to some tools. Um, we'll go there in just a couple of minutes. 
Um, if you would scroll down a little bit more, we have some of our advocacy tools. Uh, those advocacy tools include things like principles of advocacy, how you do advocacy research, um, but also how you do, do a direct action campaign. And, um, and, then, and then in addition to that, how you respond to counterattacks. So we came up with this sort of thing called the 10 Ds, um, and the 10 Ds are, are listed in there. I can never get them straight, so I'm not gonna list them for you. Um, but, but essentially, you know, it's things like dulcifying or sweetening up. Um, they're they're counterattacks, they're denying, they're um, deflecting. Um, things that we see in the media all the time in, in political fights and in, um, and in other sort of, um, sort of direct action um, type activities. Um, well, people who are community advocates really need to understand them. They need to have um, language to, to know what's going on, but then they also need to know how to respond. And so we've got very detailed notes in there. We've also got tools related to evaluation. These are our evaluation tools. So um, these are very much the same tools we use. We don't have, there's probably a few surveys that we use regularly that aren't there, but, but outside of that, it's what we use for community initiatives. And then um, issues related to applying for grants and getting financial and managing financial resources, quality improvement, quality performance, and then sustainability of an initiative as well. So you can see, we literally have it all. Soup to nuts, beginning to end, it's a little overwhelming, um, but there's a lot there. Let me take, let me stop there and see if there's any questions. I don't have in front of me the um, chat room, but uh, I don't keep an eye on that. I don't see any right now, Vince, but uh, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Absolutely, I should have mentioned that before as well, but um, if you do have questions, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on that so that um, I can answer them as, as, as we go along. David, if you wouldn't mind scrolling back up to the top. Okay. Let me show off a couple of other features. So if you, if you mouse over help taking action, which is the second button, um, you'll see under there, there's several different things, um, a troubleshooting guide, um, the justice action toolkit, and um, best change processes, and then ask an advisor. If you, would, if you would click on Justice Action Toolkit, please. So you can see here, this is that mashup that I was mentioning. And so we tried to um, take the themes and, and try to distill the needs. Um, we have people that are on our development team, the, the development of the content, that have been around from the beginning of the community toolbox, many of whom go back into the 60s with our activism. And so some of our analogies are a little old, but they're all coming back around. And so we, we link to organizations that are very much involved in training others for social justice, such as the Highlander Center in Tennessee. Um, and, and that's been a, a major force actually in the social justice movement since the 30s and 40s um, in reality, um, and, and, and many others as well. Um, but, but you can see that, you know, we've got tools listed here um, that include things like registering voters that actually, Stephen Fawcett, who is one of my partners in crime here, um, that was actually, that comes directly out of his dissertation in 1973, um, where he did a, a voter drive and he started creating um, a very systematic science-based approach to increase, increasing not only um, voter registration, but also voter turnout. So this year, um, we've got an election year, um, and, and so we wanted to make sure that was at the top of the list because we've got a pitiful voter turnout in the United States. And, and there are some other countries that do as well. And then there are other countries that have incredibly good voter turnouts, such as New Zealand, who routinely gets over 90%. Um, and, and that's something we aspire to. Writing letters to the editor or elected officials um, using social media and digital advocacy, organizing boycotts, uh, initiating legal action. There's, there's a lot of depth in here, and we partner with experts in the field when we don't have them on our team. Um, so, so those are really good. Um, David, if you could um, scroll up again a little bit, and, uh, and then um, let's go to Ask an Advisor, which is under Help Taking Action. And so here we have a list of advisors, including myself, 
um, and, and a few others um, within this, you will no you might note that this um, the the images represent a certain amount of diversity, um, but this is the short list of our volunteers. It's a it is a worldwide group of volunteers that that will answer questions in multiple languages. So people can just type in their question, they put their name and their email address, go through the CAPTCHA stuff, and um, and we will get back to them within 24 hours. And they can also search. We've got a keyword and an organized search within um, the Ask an Advisor that allows us to be able to um, not only um, see what other people have done, but, but really, you know, drill down. It's very context sensitive um, within this. And so, you know, let's go back to the community toolbox. There we go. And um, so the Ask an Advisor, really important um, sort, of a, sort of a frame. Um, let's see, a couple of other things that I want to show you. We're about 30 minutes in. Um, David, if you would scroll over on the right-hand side, the very right-hand um, button that's in that toolbar, it's, it's our services. So you can see underneath there, we actually have several different things. Um, the first one is a workstation sign-in, and if you would go there, please. So here you can see where we have um, worked with, we work with people literally all over the world, and this is a short list of clients, um, both local here to Douglas County and Kansas and, and the sort of um, central sort of four-state region um, that comprises Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and, and Kansas, but also the rest of the country. And um, we're a WHO collaborating center. There's about a thousand of them worldwide. We partner specifically with the Pan American Health Organization. Um, but we also do a lot of work partnering with the WHO African Regional Office. Um, unfortunately, I can't take you there because it's password protected. And um, and I don't have any way of typing my password in. And, and then there's like a whole two-factor authentication thing. But you can see that we've got a variety of different clients. Um, David, if you would hit the back button or go back to the community toolbox um, tab, any one of the community toolbox tabs you have open. Yeah, good enough. There's no easy way to, from, to go from that sign-in page back into the community toolbox. I don't know why. I've asked for that for like 20 years. I'm just the guy in charge. Um, but if you would go back to services and then mouse over the services and um, click on the um, community workstations, the fourth one down there, yeah, that's it. So here you can see a little bit more about um, our, our, there's like a very short video. We're not going to play it today. Um, but you'll see there's a list of customizable features. It is a Microsoft SharePoint collaboration site. It's optimized for community organizations to be able to share files, use calendar, send out messages, um, do their own blog. Some of our clients use it extensively, some very little. Um, but it's, it's, it's there and it's a great resource that we make available for community partners. We've also got a community checkbox evaluation tool. Um, David, if you wouldn't mind scrolling back up to the top and um, in that services tab, um, just click on community checkbox evaluation system. And on this page, we have, you know, some of our clients listed, but it has more information about what the community checkbox evaluation system does. So people can actually enter their data in the system and then they can analyze the data based on our science-based approach that we developed starting about 30 years ago in reality and have been continually improving ever since. And um, it'll allow you to document effective action. It'll allow you to show that action to others and it'll allow you to analyze the content of the data um, using some standard approaches to um, question asking 
and some really robust quality control approaches that we use in order to be able to um, share your information with others. Community organizers tell us that this is the first time, using these tools, this is the first time they've had an evaluation tool that allows them to tell their story in such a way that it makes sense to other people. And that's really powerful because community organizing has been going on for a long time, but I hear it over and over and over again um, from folks. And so this bit of a website provides a little bit of an overview and a tour. Um, if we could go back to the community toolbox, please, David. Thank you. And um, let's see, no more questions in the chat room just yet. Um, a couple of different things. The, um, the, the language base is actually sensitive to the language that's, that's selected as the main language within a person's browser, but they can also choose their own language um, through that pull down. And you can see there that um, we've got Spanish and English, Arabic and Farsi. Um, Farsi uses the same alphabet, roughly the same alphabet as, as Spanish. Um, or excuse me, as, as Arabic, um, but, but slightly different ways. And um, it's um, all very context sensitive. Um, if, if it picks up, if it goes to the wrong language, a person can easy, easily um, change that. Um, or if I'm doing presentations, say in Spanish, I can use that. I usually don't do that in Arabic or Farsi because I cannot read those languages. And, but we partner with folks uh, worldwide to do that. Um, also domestically, there's actually quite a few domestic users of the Arabic translation. Um, we partnered with the Institute for War and Peace Reporting um, based out of London um, on the Farsi translation, and they're doing training of community organizers in Iran, but also in um, Farsi-speaking communities throughout the world. And, um, and it's been wonderful partnership. Um, the people that are being trained are not being trained to, to be disruptors as much as they are to be facilitators. They're, they're really, we, we have a very strong ethical stance about um, not only keeping people safe, but we're working within systems to improve them. And, and so this is a really important point. And so we're careful about who we partner with. And the Institute for War and Peace Reporting was made up, their board of directors is actually made up of um, war reporters, um, led initially at least, if not still today, by Christiane Am Anampur um, from CNN International. Well, it's not just her, it's a whole lot of her colleagues from many other, um, from Reuters, from many other, Al Jazeera, many other um, news services um, worldwide that are, are part of that organization. So we, we felt that was a very credible organization. It's been a great partnership. I've delivered quite a few of their webinars and, um, and, and signed many certification forms um, from, from the people that they've trained. Um, let's see if there's another place that we could go here. Um, yeah, actually help taking action if you'd mouse over there. And um, within that, if you would click on best change processes. So here is our best guess of the dozen or so processes that are the best bets for making community systems improvement actually work for population level health outcomes. We've got a lot of data on this now. This started as a list of seven. We called them the seven factors for success. And we've expanded it a little bit because we had to unpack a couple of them. And so, um, and then reorganize it. So this is organized around the Institute of Medicine um, health community health promotion model that is widely used. Uh, we worked with them to help develop that model. And um, now these tools are organized within that model. Um, so it, it follows, like I said earlier, it follows some very standard um, approaches uh, to, to um, community organizing for health outcomes. And, um, and, and this is basically the, 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 the summary of all of the other ones that are out there, that many that were created by, by CDC, um, by WHO, by many other organizations, um, this actually cuts a, cuts a line across 
all of those other models that are out there. So if you click on any one of these, David, um, yeah, it's a good one, developing leadership. So we have information uh, very much like the table of contents. We have information about what it is, why do it, how it works, and then there's um, links within that to other resources within the community toolbox. And so, but not just in the community toolbox, also elsewhere. So we've got our, our, our references listed. Well, I guess there's not a lot connected in this one. If you click on overview again, if you scroll down, that might be where the links to the community toolbox stuff is. Oh, maybe not. Scroll back up, please. Supports. Click on supports. Success. So um, here's where the links back into the community toolbox and occasionally to external websites um, exist. And um, I don't use this too often. I'm usually using the table of contents or the classes I teach, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. But you can see that a lot of core ideas in leadership, the, the basic model is a servant leadership model within this because we've bought into that model for a very long time. Um, and, and service leadership, servant leadership is, is really a winner. Uh, there's, leadership is probably the most written about topic in the world. Here I am talking to librarians. You probably know that better than I do. Um, but, it, you know, there's virtually very little, it, there's almost no really good pithy how-to on leadership that's out there. There's some things that are tailored for some specific outcomes, but what we've tried to do is, is really take that idea, the model of servant leadership, and, and really frame that in, in such a way that um, people can use it in a community health promotion context. So, um, as you can see along the left-hand side, the rest of the um, of the of the um, best processes, um, we we tend towards best processes as a, as opposed to best programs because the reality is most programs don't work. They're so hard to replicate. You know, a, a, a program for a single program for um, for changing behavior in a community context around any health outcome is very hard to replicate to the point where very few of them, there's maybe eight or 10 or 12 at the most that have actually been replicated. All the rest of them, all the rest of the databases of programs that are out there, yeah, they, they've, they, they have some evidence behind them, but the reality is that it's the process that really makes them work. You have to reinvent that every single time in the new context. So rather than focusing on some programs, we really focused on this whole idea of, of the processes that it takes to be able to replicate other work and to implement it in such a way that people can replicate the results by using the means, the methodology that really makes sense in their context. And that's a really important framing and, and that's the reason behind all of this. So we, we focus a little bit more on on the process to try to get to the outcome, as opposed to replica replicating a, a few practices, which rarely yield the same result in a new context, as there's so much that's different. Um, let's see, scroll back up, no questions yet. So if, um, let's see, where should I go from here? David, I'm gonna leave it to you. What do you want to explore? And if there, if you have a question, I'm glad to sort of go there and provide some explanation or a little bit of help. All right, I guess we can go to some of the, more of this toolkit specifically that might be of value for our uh, library and other partners here. Um, and let's see here, I think uh, Probably a lot of stuff we talk about is increasing partnerships and memberships because a lot of the times in library and public health, we're trying to get our partners and members to engage and work with us and work across these areas and think about things like that. So really getting into those ideas of it. And really what I do like about the toolbox personally is that we have examples um, and you guys very provide very 
they're very practical examples that can be done and have been done out in the community, out beyond just, just, just what's been done in the, uh, in this idea. Uh, and I guess there is one question that just came in is, oh, is there any plans to offer versions in Mandarin or simplified Chinese or any other like oh, Asian yeah. language? Wow, what a great question. Thank you. Um, yes and no. We, this has been one of our, one of our wish list items for about 20 years. And so we've had several undergraduates. I'm really lucky and a couple of my other faculty colleagues are really lucky. We um, seem to attract university scholars. That's the top 5% of the honor students at KU. And the honor students at KU are the top 5% of all the students. And so that top 5% of the top 5% university scholars, oftentimes they are language and pre-med and microbiology or organic chemistry or some really complicated, difficult major. They got a 4-0 and then they go on to do other things. And we've had three or four now over the past 20, 25 years that have been either Ford Fellows or they've gotten a Truman Fellowship or they've gotten something and they've had, they've been, they've been also Chinese language scholars. And we've talked and we've dreamed about translating this into Mandarin or simplified Chinese format. We have not found the partner yet that will do this. And it's been really, it's been a little bit frustrating, but it's, it's a challenge. We don't know what we're doing. That's a, that's a, that's such a foreign culture and a foreign language that I wish we could, I wish we knew a little bit more about how to approach even tran considering translating into Mandarin. But we would, we very much look forward to a partnership. So if you know anybody, we're, we're always happy to talk <laughs> and, um, and to really figure out how it is that we can go after funding together. Um, the Arabic translation, like I said, is about 60% done. That cost about $400,000 and it's only 60% done. And um, we don't have that kind of a budget. And in fact, we have no budget. Um, we sell our services and when we have, you know, like we do workshops, fee-for-service workshops and capacity building, and some of that money we put off into an endowment account. And that's what we're using to maintain the servers, pay the, the software development team, um, pay our, our um, graphic artist um, who works with us on, on this material. And we have to partner with people and go after money together to do any other development, whether it's new sections in the toolbox or the translation. So if you know anybody who might be a donor, I'd love to talk to that person. Um, and that's how it is that we got the Arabic translation, actually. Um, it was a brokered deal with a, a very major donor who had a very particular interest in community organizing and community improvement in Arabic speaking communities worldwide. And so we've had a number of projects with um, several different foundations now. The, I've worked in the past with uh, um, the Zakat Foundation. Um, they're worldwide, but I think they're, they've got a main office in Chicago. Uh, Zakat in Arabic means tithing, donations, um, and, and that's a major foundation that does that. We've worked with the NAMA Foundation in Kuala Lumpur related to that. Um, we have not worked with, with, we just don't have any connections in China. And so we would love to build those connections and make it functional um, around community building. Um, we will partner with anybody that really is about the same kind of purposes of us, helping create a world in which people can be successful. So that leaves it pretty wide open. Um, well, well, thank you on that. Um, I guess one other question I have is for a lot of organizations that are thinking about writing grants and writing projects and proposals and all, how do you see that the toolbox can sort of be used to help in that idea mm -hmm. where there's certain things they should focus on or is everything more relevant or not in this process? Oh, it's totally relevant. And so, if you would go back to the table of contents, click on the learn a skill and then table of contents. So scroll down to the bottom. So you'll see the next to the last 
box there is generating grants and financial resources. And there's also a toolkit. I, I use this in my community development, community health promotion class. And so it's not just about just writing a grant. It's also really about developing a plan for fi financial sustainability. So we lead people through, we walk people through um, that process of developing a plan for financial sustainability, um, but also a business plan, um, as well as writing grant proposals. Writing an NIH grant proposal is very different from writing a, a grant proposal to a local community foundation or a conversion foundation. So many conversion foundations, there's not really a grant application. They have a list of 10 questions. You answer those questions. You send it in, and then they either decide they want to talk to you and interview you, or they say, thank you very much, we don't do that work. Um, community foundations, that's more about relationship building. For an organization like NIH, or a number of foundations like uh, William T. Grant Foundation, or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, those are more like applied research grants in many cases. Well, that's a different approach. Um, NIH, of course, has you know, a, an approach that values the scholarship and the science basis more than the other pieces. Um, places like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, William T. Grant Foundation, many of the others, they, they want to demonstrate results through evaluation, but they really want a lasting change. They want, they want something to be a positive difference. Um, they're looking for a few good stories. Well, those are four or five different approaches that I just laid out. So writing a grant is really complicated. We try to draw a line between all those in our applying for a grant section and have some resources and examples in order to, for people to be able to see, well, what's a grant look like? Because there are many community organizations, they have never seen a completed grant application. Maybe they've seen their own, but they don't know what that looks like relative to anybody else's because they've not been part of that process. So we have a number of grant applications, real ones, where we've changed the name and, um, and made them available so people can, can um, model their grant proposal off of things that we know worked in the past. Okay. Thank also, you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, and I, another, another question here is, we know the public libraries are one of the most requested entities in the community. How can public libraries become partners with researchers to improve community health? Thank you for that question. That is perfect set up. Um, so many local libraries are, um, they, they're hiring people. You probably know, you all probably know more about this, but they're hiring people with different specialty areas. People who are trained librarians, either with a master's in library science or or, or other training as a librarian, depending on where they're at, um, that have specific training as a public health librarian or community development specialist. So here in Lawrence, for example, um, we partner extensively with our public health librarian at the Lawrence Public Library. And um, she is really outstanding, and she's curated some of the materials out of the community toolbox to make them available for community initiatives and then makes herself available. So we partner with people locally um, to be able to, um, you know, really curate tools, also tailor tools, but also to provide um, trainings and workshops in many cases as well. Um, and and I, I partner with the librarians here at the University of Kansas, in many cases around the courses that I, do, that I develop and implement. And I bring them in, actually, to, to do workshops within my classes so that the undergraduate and the graduate students can get some of that expertise that people bring in. Um, I, I feel awkward talking about librarians in front of um, a webinar full of librarians, but a couple of things that I've, been, that I've learned over the years is all you all are about knowledge management. Oh, my God, what a gift that is. We do not take advantage of that to the extent that we really should. And so one of my dream items is actually to partner with librarians around curating the community toolbox itself. How do we take this interface and take it to the next level of utility so that people can get access to things? One idea that I've had is to use chatbots and to, and to build 
off of a chatbot or an AI infrastructure? Well, that's going to cost some money, um, but we also need to have the right knowledge management professionals to be able to do that well. And so um, uh, that's, a, that's an opportunity for us to be partnering with the librarian in a new way. Um, those are three examples. Um, I hope that helps put it into context. I think so, and, th and thank you for that answer as well. Um, I, are there any other questions we have from the audience or anything that anybody would like more information on? Please feel free to type in, ask questions. We are here to uh, guide you in the best way we can because, again, uh, I think we are seeing in the field of public health and in the field of library science the importance of uh, sharing public resources, sharing information, and sharing these resources to make everybody sort of have access to these requirements and access to the information uh, and make it available and accessible, um, which, again, uh, kind of backing on what you said, Ben. Uh, I guess another question we could ask is what, what, what are sort of the future directions for your community toolbox going forward? I know you've talked about that you're working with the language. Are there any other things that you're thinking about or any new projects or plans being developed? Yeah, we've, we've, we need to go back to some of the tools that we wrote in the early years and completely revise those. Um, for example, the social justice tools or the most recent revision. And we've taken a few of those and, um, and, and really um, made them a lot more current and relevant within this. But we've actually got to do that in, in quite a few. Our strategic planning tools are still re relevant but we've not updated them, I think, since maybe around 1998. And we've got some, well, I should, what I should say more accurately is that we've updated the PowerPoint presentation there, but not necessarily the content. And, and so that's a really important one for us. Partnering with folks to make these tools available. The entire community toolbox is free, by the way. We don't charge for it. It's, you know, it's um, people, we just ask people, if they're using our stuff, cite the source, give us credit for what it is that we're providing. If you're adapting it, we want you to make sure, we want others who are adapting these tools to say, hey, I adapted this and take credit for that. But we also want to cite the source. We use a Creative Commons copyright um, to that extent. Um, we don't ask people to, to either donate or provide us with any funding unless they're making money off us. If they're taking this and they're making money, yeah, we, we would like people to actually um, donate, uh, but that's, we, we tend to partner with folks and, and we see, and we want to see more of that worldwide. Um, I had mentioned the NAMA Foundation in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, two years ago, we worked with them to provide eight months worth of training. We had two weeks of training that myself and one of my colleagues did in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and then we provided um, monthly or bi-monthly online training for people in eight Arabic-speaking, predominantly Muslim countries, Indonesia, um, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Syria. Um, even though it was, a, it was an active war zone at the time, um, there were a lot of people that are actually were doing some really incredible community building there in, in many of the, the really hardest hit communities as well. So we were providing technical support to them. We want to see more of that happen. We want to partner with foundations in the future um, to be able to help support their grantees. Um, we worked, one of the countries that was part of that was, also, was Tanzania. And um, folks in Tanzania um, really were focused on um, things like access to clean water and, and a lot of other public health sort of stuff. It was some people at a medical school there. and. Um, and um, their, their project actually was called, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess up the name. I shouldn't try to quote their name. Um, but, but anyways, it, it, um, they were doing a lot of really great work in, in really small communities throughout Tanzania. And, it, and, and so that kind of stuff really is, is what we see as the future. It allows us to um, also collect new stories. We also wanna do here soon, it probably won't be this year, or maybe even next year, but we want to um, soon relaunch our out of the box prize where we invite people worldwide to submit little, little video clips and photos 
in, in a brief abstract about their local project. And so the out of the box prize is something we've done twice now. And that's where we've gotten some of our best examples. Um, and, and we provide some funding for them, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 or 1,000, sometimes as much as $2,000, depending on what we have going on. Um, we um, have mashups with other really prominent websites like um, healthypeople.gov, which is the health objectives for the nation. They have got some pages oriented around not just, um, you know, collecting information about your, your community and, and understanding public health problems from your county perspective, but they've also got um, like an action toolkit within that that you can click into. Well, about two thirds of that is actually the community toolbox. Um, same thing for county health rankings. County health rankings, they provide county-based data for every county in the United States. And then they've also got um, an action tool side well, a lot of that is the community toolbox as well. And, and so we see those as part of our future. Um, I think the partnership idea with foundations to help support their grantees, that's a winner. Um, we've, we've really not found a home in that yet. I, I sell our evaluation skills to um, their grantees and to foundations. We, we partner with a few very prominent ones but not the broader technical support. And we want to be an infrastructure for that as well. So several ideas. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Do we have other questions from the audience or anything else that people are interested in or curious about out there? Uh, please, we will take the next couple minutes here to the two questions that I'll, I'll be doing some wrapping up here. I wanted to thank Dr. Francisco for his presentation today. I really do appreciate the time he has taken today to present and talk about how libraries and uh, the community toolbox and how uh, programs can be developed and implemented and tools that can be used to improve are out, there, out here. Um, and we really do appreciate the time he has uh, uh, has spent today with us today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this is part of the, our regular uh, monthly webinars pro project through the uh, Mid-Continental Region. Um, not all of our programs will offer CE, but some of them will. Uh, also, if you are looking for more uh, CHESS CEs in the future, we do offer a number of other resources and courses as well as uh, web live recorded webinars to give you these opportunities. Uh, at the end of the conclusion of this, we will be providing a uh, a YouTube video link to this uh, recording, so you can always come back and watch it and find out and find out the contact information. Uh, we do appreciate everybody for coming today. And as a reminder, once you exit today, you should be able to receive a should receive a link to complete an evaluation to claim for test credits if you are interested in that. And even if you're not interested, you can please fill out the evaluation. We take that seriously, and we can use it. To provide future fund programming and funder uh, opportunities uh, at, in the future for uh, our region as well as for the National Network of the Libraries of Medicine. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, any parting words from Suzanne or from Vince? So this is Vincent Francisco. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share these tools and resources. Um, we hope that it helps the work that you're doing. And please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, my email is VTF, Victor Thomas Frank, uh, Vincent Thomas Francisco, it's VTF at KU.edu. And I do look forward to hearing from folks and maybe we can partner in the future. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Suzanne. Thank you to everyone, and we'll go ahead and, and close out the session, I guess, right now. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. Bye. Okay.